water. I learned how to swim, or I was be, I was taught how to swim when I was eight-ish, but I never caught on. Everybody was able to swim, and I never caught on. They would do the go against the wall, kick your feet, you know, try to teach me to tread water, and I just never caught on. And I always thought that I was just not able to swim. You know what I mean? So I was like, maybe my body's too dense. I don't know. So. Um, a while ago, I would say like a year ago, I went on like a health journey. I lost like 90 pounds. Wow. During that time, I literally watched Johnny's videos and kind of taught myself via YouTube. Now, there's a lot that I still have to learn, but I definitely would not classify as myself as that I cannot swim. But I still have a lot of problems where like if I swim, I cannot go fast. Like, I don't care what I do. I don't care how much power I use, how like how much I try to glide I do not swim faster than um, like three minutes for 100 so it's really frustrating I've tried everything um, so I'm here in person now to see if that will make a difference That's it. and it will yeah. <laughs> All right, Rocketeers, today we have Pamela in the water with us today. She's an adult beginner. She knows how to swim and survive, but we're gonna make her a lot more efficient in the water today and tomorrow. You're gonna like what you see here, and if you need some of the tips that you've seen in this video and you can apply it yourself, great. If not, let me know. Maybe we could set up a trip for you to come to Austin, Texas and swim with me in this pool, just like Pamela, who is from Georgia, is here today swimming with us in Austin, Texas. I want to be the world's online swim coach. I don't want anyone to have to go through life not knowing how to swim. It's a life-saving skill and it's very enjoyable. So go ahead and watch us, hit that like button, and let's swim. Starting on the kickboard because you get two things accomplished by starting on the kickboard. One, stretching your spine out. Whether you realize it or not, as you walk throughout the day, you lose almost half an inch in height. So getting on the, on the board and stretching out in the water will allow you to make everything else better afterwards, okay? Second reason is your legs are about twice the size of your arms. They need more time to warm up. Because your legs take that extra time to warm up. So I like to get, kill two birds with one stone. That's not actual, I don't kill birds. <laughs> this is a uh, uh, PETA friendly. And go ahead and kick all the way down to the other end, facing the water if you'd like. Good, stop right there for a break. Nice. Now, I'll take the kickboard. What I'm gonna have you try next is hands at the top of the board only because it might be easier for you. When they're at the top, you can keep your head up or down. If you're gonna put it down, I like to say come up for one breath at a time and then put your head back down and come up kind of like on an interval regularly. If you're gonna keep your head up, that's fine. Just breathe, you don't need an interval. But your legs will get really tired on a kickboard fast if you don't have oxygen. So I highly recommend hands up here and breathing more. separated into four parts, quadrants. Our front quadrant is from our fingertips to our elbows or our head. The second quadrant is the head to the shoulders. The third quadrant is your torso and the fourth quadrant is your legs. When your hands swim from back here, your legs will stick. And that's a pretty common mistake for swimmers to make is swimming with their arms behind them and sinking their legs. So I teach front quadrant swimming or superhero swimming if you're a child. 
and stay out front and wait for one another to catch up. So one of the things I like to do before trying it on your own is doing it on the kickboard. So you hold the kickboard at the bottom, thumbs underneath, fingertips on top, stretch the kickboard out before you start swimming so that you're taking full strokes. On the kickboard, ready, go. of want your head below your arms because if it's up, gravity's pulling it down. Everything that's in the air is getting sunk down. So even though earlier I said we're trying to swim higher in the water, it's to a point. If you were to be able to lift yourself out of the water, it's going to be a matter of time before you come crashing back down. But allow your head to sink below your arms like this. Don't feel much smoother. Excellent. Good. Did you feel any difference? Good. Yes. Here already. That's what I like to hear. Yes. So we're making it quicker in the water. So that is the step right before losing the kickboard and doing it on your own. Now today I have a special tool for you called a keel, and you're not going to find this really anywhere else because it's not a very popular device yet. It's brand new. This is going to be the step between the kickboard and doing it on your own. So with the keel, you're gonna pinch it back here between your thumb and your forefinger. Now the idea to, with the keel is you're pushing it forward. So you don't want to grab it because then you're gonna to start to shorten up your strokes and the keel's gonna get right up against your head. Instead, you wanna pinch it and push it forward and switch, push and forward. And it's gonna tip a little bit, so it's gonna require a little bit of coordination. And then when we take it away, all of a sudden, everything's gonna feel easier. Because this is gonna make it a little bit harder. So I want to wear fins for it too. Okay. So did you bring your own fins I here today? Awesome. Go put your fins on. <laughs> Three, two, one, go. Another thing that keel can accomplish is not just stretching the stroke out in front, but also creating a stronger pull. Because the only way you move forwards in the water is if you're redirecting water backwards, which you do with your arms and your legs. Your kick redirects water backwards, your pull redirects water backwards. With the keel in hand, as this hand pushes forward, you want you to pull this hand farther backwards so you're creating a longer body line in the water. It's gonna require then, or it's gonna, it, you're gonna need less strokes to get across the pool. Less strokes means you have more energy left. More energy left means you can keep going. And if that adds up with less strokes, you can accomplish maybe 200 meters, whereas you used to be get 150. Right. But the idea is the best way a swimmer can coach herself is by counting her strokes. Because when you count your strokes and you know your goal is to get lower stroke counts, then your body naturally does whatever it takes to get more efficient. You'll kick stronger, your head will stay stop still, you'll reach a little bit farther out in front, it'll be a better experience all the way around. Okay, so on this one, I want you to think of also about that pull backwards okay. and really redirecting more water. Ready? So eight and six is 14. Now a stroke count of 14 with the keel is understandable. When you use the keel, it'll go up a little bit. 
my stroke count actually is 14. So that's really impressive that you're already hitting that. Because um, uh, 12 strokes from where we started earlier would have been about 25 total. So to get that stroke count under 20 is your new goal, okay? That's what you're gonna be training for this year is getting your stroke count under 20. It might take a whole year to do it. That's okay. We're gonna go 225s. A 25 is one leg. We're gonna go 225s. Regular freestyle, so no keel. After this, we're gonna take a break, deep press, and talk about what we're doing next. strokes so efficient your strokes coming all the way out back they're resting out in front how many breaths did you take you must get really tired we're gonna work we're, uh, the next the next thing we're gonna go to is breaths okay all right one more lap like that that was gorgeous ready go strokes again what you're gonna find is that your stroke count will be the same number most of the time or a variation of like one away from it on either side one less or one more but 19 strokes with fins on your goal then should be 17 we're gonna decrease it by two doesn't need to be today I'm just saying okay. that's what you're working with toward fins. Okay. with fins is 17 without we still have yet to get a stroke count determination on that yeah. I think we already said maybe 20 is that what I said something like that so it'll be around 20 without fins and 17 with fins. Next, we're gonna move into the breathing stage. Now, breathing when you swim is very important. A lot of people have the misunderstanding that swimming is about holding your breath and about trying to go as far as you can without breathing. And a long time ago, even in competitive swimming, people were told that when you breathe, it slows you down. However, over time we've realized that a consistent early breath will give you the stamina you need without having to be in really good shape. Because oxygen fires your muscles and when you deplete your muscles from the oxygen by holding your breath too long, you're gonna feel that fiery burning feel in your muscles. So, breathing consistently like every two or three strokes and breathing early by pulling and starting your breath while your pole's still underwater will give you enough time to take a deep breath and give you enough breaths each lap to keep you going for longer distances. All right, so we're gonna work on breathing with Pamela. She already knows how to breathe to the side, and if you need to learn how to breathe to the side, watch my side breathing video. If you already know how to breathe to the side, then this is where you're going to pick up as well. just did that lap in 17 strokes and if you remember we were just telling her that her goal should be to get her stroke count down to 17. We haven't done any laps in between the last clip and this clip. In one lap she got her stroke count down another two. Could have been the fact that she was focusing on her breath. It might have probably had to do with the fact that she's getting more comfortable with her head position lower, her arms being patient out front thanks to the keel and having the fins on is just making her a better swimmer. So with that said, when you're learning to swim, especially when you're learning to breathe, wear fins. Fins make it so that you don't have to survive in the water, but rather you can focus on the technique that you've been given to work on. So I like to tell my adult beginners, even my kids, wear lots of fins. 
you'll master concept sooner and you'll be able to apply it then to the, the stroke without fins. Fins technically make you work harder. So if you're thinking, oh, I, I don't wanna become fin dependent and only be able to swim with fins, don't worry. Fins technically make it harder on you to swim because you're kicking more water with each kick. It's like adding weight to a weightlifting session. You're kicking more water. You like it because you go faster. And that's because fins are more efficient. You don't have holes in your toe, or you have holes in between your toes, but you don't have holes in the fins. That's what makes it more efficient and it it's harder. All right, so now we're gonna talk about your frequency. The frequency of your breath should be every two or three strokes. Right now, you're not comfortable enough doing two, which is breathing to the same side every single time. Once you get more comfortable with swimming, you're gonna get better at that circular breathing and you should try to get down to two strokes. The reason for that is because you'll last longer. Since you like to do triathlons, the swimming portion is at the very beginning. Worst time for the swimming portion to be because people will hold their breath and burn their muscles out before they even get to the second stage of the triathlon. So breathe, if you're doing triathlons, breathing two is exactly what you want to get down to. Every two strokes, so that it's just no holding your breath, just right? But we're gonna work our way down there by doing five strokes. And we're gonna do four, then we're gonna do three, and then we'll get down to two. I'll give you lots of rest in between them because you're still gonna be probably thinking about how, the timing of your breath. Adults usually like to try to do more than one correction at once. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. So I will, we'll just move at a slower pace okay. <laughs> just so that you can keep working on the timing as well. Now, when you're breathing to the same side, that means you're taking an even number of strokes between breaths. So if you're breathing every two strokes, every four strokes, or every six strokes, you're gonna end up breathing to the same side every time. If you're breathing an odd number of strokes, like three, five, or seven, then you're gonna be alternating sides that you breathe on. So if you're, giving an, if you're given an odd number to breathe, then you should be alternating sides. If you're given an even number, then you should be breathing on the same side. The one thing I noticed when you started breathing every three strokes, which was more frequent, is that your kick got stronger. And a strong kick will help you go faster, but a strong kick will also wear you out. And that's okay. What we're seeing is the advantage of breathing more frequently. The next step for triathletes, at least, would be to stop that kick from being aggressive too, just because you have more oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. But we'll get there in a little bit. Okay. Let's get down to two okay. strokes. So you're gonna be breathing to the same side. Likely your stroke rate will go higher. Got it. Okay. It's gonna go higher. So you're probably gonna take 22, okay. 23 strokes. That's okay. Just have fun not holding your breath at all. Okay. <laughs> first taught to breathe twos. I was a freshman in high school and I thought it was so weird. It felt very abnormal for me to basically be breathing 
and swimming at the same time, never even once thinking about holding my breath. Right. Strange. It'll take some getting used to, but what you're gonna find is your body pumps up higher in the water. By breathing too, is you're constantly lifting your body, lifting it, lifting it. The counter, the counterpart to that would be it's coming back down and sinking, but you're not doing that. That's someone who literally lifts their head out of the water to breathe. You're not doing that. So by that subtle turn to the side, your body is coming up higher and staying higher. So let's go another breathing twos, and then we'll let you choose your favorite. Okay. Let's stick with that for a Your stroke count did not go up as high as I thought it might. You were sitting at 18 and 19 on those 225s. Not very far off 17. So, what's your favorite stroke, or what is your favorite breath rate? Um, I think I would have to say three. Probably. Nice, that's okay. Yeah. Most coaches in the world teach threes. <laughs> it's not until you become a distance swimmer or a triathlete that you're usually taught to. So threes is perfectly, perfectly acceptable and it's the most common breathing pattern there is. Now we're gonna move on towards the pull. The pull has so many different aspects to it. It also always depends on the person's body type, what their shoulders and elbows are capable of doing. But the ideal pull in swimming would be an early vertical forearm or a high elbow catch. So when your hand enters the water out front, you want it to float farther out front to a full extension. You don't wanna roll till your elbow drops, Fully extend with your elbow up. From here, you wanna keep the elbow up like it's anchoring there and let the fingertips come straight down to the bottom of the pool because you're always traveling in the direction of the back of your hand. So if you wanna travel forwards, then as soon as you start your pull, the first thing that needs to happen is fingertips down and then start the pull backwards. When your arm is above the water, this is called the recovery portion of the stroke and it should be just that. It needs to be recovery. A lot of people will be too aggressive with their hand in the air here thinking that somehow this is what's moving them forward in the water and that's just not true. This is recovery. The pole moves you forward in the water, all right? So the part, portion up here needs to be thoughtless or effortless. When your arm's above the water, if you're thinking about it, you're putting forth too much effort. Let it do whatever it does. Some people are straight arm recovery people. Some people come up with a high elbow just like they had a high elbow underwater. That usually looks the prettiest, but some people have made a straight arm recovery faster for them. And that's why I say it really depends on the individual. Don't peg swimming or any stroke or any technique and don't let any coach peg any technique into a one size fits all format. It just isn't realistic. There are too many body types out there and we have seen Olympians, gold medalists, world record holders with completely different techniques. All right, so we're gonna do two drills to help your catch under the water feel more efficient. The first one is called the okay drill. This one is about the, the front part of the stroke, catch out front. What you're doing is you're restricting two fingers so the pole is gonna feel like you're kind of slipping until you realize that all you get are these three fingers so you put more pressure on them. When we open your hand back up, you're gonna feel like you have a paddle on your hand. It's gonna feel like you're grabbing water. It's gonna feel really good. So we're gonna restrict in order to get that feeling a little bit more pronounced so that you know what's right and what's wrong. Right now, your body's just hoping it's doing the right thing as opposed to knowing that it's doing the right thing. The second drill we'll do is called pistol drill. It's about the back half of the stroke. We'll go over that when we're done with the okay drill. So I want you to swim out front, Making the okay sign. Thinking about that early vertical forearm catch. Okay. Alrighty. She is on her way.
probably felt frustrating. <laughs> drills often feel frustrating. Drills are exaggerations of motions. Drills often also restrict certain motions, which allows you to feel the full benefit of what the drill is either giving you or lacking. It allows you to feel the full benefit when you go back into the full stroke. strokes. Yeah. We've got her stroke count down to 16 now. Nice. We're doing work. <laughs> With the pistol drill, we're going to be talking about the back half of the pole now. Because when your hand gets about halfway through the pole, if you were to keep your wrist stiff, then eventually you'll be pulling water up, which is pushing you down. Because you're always traveling in the direction of the back of your hand. So whether you realize or not, you actually want your wrist to start flexing as you go back so that you're constantly pushing water back. And then when your arm comes out of the water, it just dangles there, lands out front, pull, you flex, bring it back out. So in order to help you with the flex, you're gonna do something called the pistol drill now. The pistol drill is the cousin to the okay drill. The pistol drill will allow you to press back with the right side of your palm, the correct side of your palm. Because when if you were to pull back off to the side like that, that would be pushing you backwards. So we want to restrict the part of the palm that isn't necessary for the back half of the pull. That's gonna make the front half of your pull maddening. It's gonna be kind of frustrating. You're gonna slip some water. Uh, yep, and then it's gonna get here and you're gonna be like, okay, that's a good press. <laughs> I like the press, but man, I hate slipping water out front. That's okay. We're only doing 225s of this and then we'll open up your hands again and you're gonna feel so good again, okay? Alrighty, ready? Go. We're opening up your hands again. You're gonna feel the full pressure of the water and it's gonna feel really good through the press back. Remember to flex the wrist though as you press back. So you anchor out front, press out back. Full hands, here we go. We're at the end of day one now. We're gonna put all of the things Pamela's learned today together at once and see how smooth we can get her freestyle to look. Now, she might not do it perfectly because things like corrections and swimming take sometimes three to six months before they become muscle memory or just natural for you to do. So she might have to think about these things, maybe one step at a time, maybe two steps, Maybe not all five things at once, but she's gonna have to think about these for some time before they start to feel natural to her. She might feel better. She probably does feel better now, 
but she's not gonna feel comfortable with these techniques, like she doesn't have to think about them for quite some time. So with that said, remember that when you're learning how to swim, you need to be patient and you need to practice a lot. Don't get frustrated with yourself. Coach Mike used to say, don't get frustrated, be patient and practice. Those were his three rules and those are great rules for adult beginner swimmers. Don't get frustrated with yourself, be patient with your progress and practice as often as you can, all right? So we're gonna put all five things together now for Pamela. We're gonna have her being more patient out front with the front quadrant freestyle. Letting her hands wait for one another before she starts another pull. We also talked about the timing of her breath. Breathing as soon as she starts a pull as if her nose and her thumb are connected by a string. You don't wanna pull and then lift your hand and your head out at the same time because then you're not gonna be able to finish your breath in time for your arm to come crashing down over your face. So you breathe as soon as you start your pull. The third thing we worked on today was the frequency of her breath. How often does she breathe? Does she breathe every five strokes, every seven? We got her down to three and we like three for her. That works really well for her. It also helps her count her strokes because she can multiply the amount of breaths she took by three to get an accurate stroke count. The fourth thing we worked on today was the okay drill in order to have a more effective catch out front. An early vertical forearm, EVF, or a high elbow catch out front is more efficient than letting your elbow drop. It's also healthier on your shoulders. The fifth thing was the pistol drills to help her press out back more effectively. A lot of people end up pushing water straight up into the air and causing their body, body to go under the water too much. Whether they realize it or not, it could be minute, but it's still happening. So instead, flexing your wrist as it goes about halfway through its pull is gonna give you a more powerful finish to your stroke. Those are the five things we're gonna try and put together here now at the end of day one. Thanks for watching. Distance per stroke, good. Yeah. DPS or distance per stroke is exactly what Pamela is figuring out for herself. I didn't say this. She figured out that as much distance as she can cover per arm stroke, the faster and easier swimming will become for her. Maybe not at first, because it's like, wow, my arm's pulling so much more water, but it definitely feels better, kind of like fins do, because even though you're pulling more water, the effects are what make you motivated to keep doing it that way. Hey Rocketeers, here we are on day two with Pamela. She is learning how to swim more efficiently and freestyle. She has been uh, on an incredible journey trying to improve her health and her wellness as well as accomplish more triathlons in her life. Yesterday we accomplished a lot of good work helping her extend her stroke out in front, being more patient swimming like a front quadrant freestyle. We helped her with her head position coming a little bit lower in the water, a high elbow catch out front, and then a press out back with a flexed wrist. Today, we're gonna help her improve the catch out front. We're gonna help her understand the importance of stroke counting, and then we'll finish with some treading water. All right, so why don't you come on and join us? We're gonna go swimming. I like to start on the kickboard because you can strength lengthen out your spine. Second reason is because your legs take longer to warm up. So we get started right away. Ready, go.
All right, now we're gonna bring in the arms again. We're gonna help her remember what it feels like to swim front quadrant swimming. With the kickboard in her hand, she's already extended out front, so this should be a very easy transition. That's why I like to start on the kickboard. It's another reason I like to start on the kickboard. So we're gonna swim superhero freestyle, front quadrant freestyle. Your hands don't have to touch, they just come side by side. Being patient allows you to take fewer strokes and it keeps your body balanced. Because if you start to swim, even with less of a pause, you're gonna find yourself starting to sink your legs, okay? So, keeping your hands always out in front will help keep you balanced. I'll show you my body with my arms by my side. You'll see my legs sink. Now I'll show you my body with my arms out in front. You'll watch me float. That's why swimming with your arms out in front or front quadrant swimming is so important. Ready? We're also gonna get a stroke count on this. Okay, without the fins, that would be fins. interesting. <laughs> exactly. I'm gonna get behind Will here. Alright, out front a little bit longer this time. In fact, I want you to tap your thumbs together out front. This is called catch-up freestyle. It's not like ketchup and mustard. It's like one hand catching up to the other. It's the most common freestyle drill for all swimmers at all ages and stages of your life. So once you got your goggles on, we're going to do catch-up freestyle back and we'll count your strokes. Excellent. Pamela, you took 22 strokes. Now, that may feel like, oh great, I got better, but you're still exhausted. Yeah. So what you what I haven't told you is by the end of today, we're gonna put a pull buoy between your legs and help you stop kicking. I'm helping you get balanced in the water first, and then we're gonna take away the kick so you'll start to feel that easy, smooth freestyle that I've been training into you up to this point. Okay, so right now, all these drills that I'm having you do still require you to kick to maintain balance. And then the pull boy that I give you, which goes between your legs, will allow you to, to stay balanced on the water without needing to kick. And it's gonna change your life. And you're gonna feel that all the work you've done up to this point is definitely made you more efficient. Because it's usually all in the arms. And if we can get your arms to be patient and not start panicking or pulling too fast or aggressively, then once we eliminate the kick, the arms do all the work, you start lasting 200 meters. Forget 100. So I'm gonna show her and the audience that they're, the way she's training right now is okay. That is a way to train with a big oversized kick, right? It's okay, yeah, it wears you out, it tires you out, but that's what you're doing to help balance yourself until you're more comfortable with your stroke that you can balance with your arms and not need the kick. It's a developed skill and it takes time. So I'll show you that what you're doing right now is actually something taught, okay? All right, so we're gonna finish our work here with freestyle today. Pamela's gonna go 225s with the fins and the keel, just to get that feeling one more time. The keel does a great job of giving a swimmer the feel that they need to have when they swim in the water. Maybe a little bit too narrow, but I like the keel better than most devices, like a kickboard that you would hold on to or anything like that. 
Then we're gonna take the keel away, leave her fins on, but help her learn how to use a pull buoy. Because when you use a pull buoy, it kind of brings your legs up to the surface of the water, and it also restricts your kick. Now technically, you could still kick with a pull buoy. In fact, I'm quite good at that. It's called cheating. But you really should try to let your legs start to, to dangle behind you when you're using a pull buoy. And then after that, we'll take her fins off, so it's just the pull buoy. Take the pull buoy out. So 825's here to finish our work on freestyle. gonna do that one more time start to think about using your arms more to move forward and less on your kick start to rely less on your kick actively thinking about that before you get the, ne the next device that's gonna force you to do it will help the transition be a little smoother so you're not shocked by the device just eliminating your kick or anything okay ready go That's already like so much, just watching this lesson so much better, dude. All right, so the pull boy between your legs helps restrict your kick a little bit. Try to squeeze your legs to keep the pull boy in just enough, but don't overdo it. You shouldn't be in pain, but you should feel like your arms are doing most of the work at this point. Done. 16. Next 225s are with a pull buoy but no fins so it's going to restrict her a little bit even more. She's going to probably feel pretty slow on this lap and that's okay because then we'll take the pull buoy out and she'll feel natural again. If she were to put the fins on after that, that would be finishing a practice feeling great and I like doing that. So I might let her get an extra 225s in with fins <laughs> so that she feels fantastic at the end of today's workout. encouraging because when we take the pull boy out that's only gonna go down once you get a kick back you're a lot you're gonna be going your stroke count will go down because your kick will help accelerate you Great. yeah so 23 with the pull boy was awesome ready I'm ready for you yeah Excellent. The thing I love most about today so far is that just now you asked me if I was ready for the first time because you wanted to keep moving. That is, that is proof that when you're consistent and patient with your progress and the techniques you're learning, you can improve so fast that now you kind of want to keep going. You don't really want to stop. So I guess what I'm saying is the proof is in the pudding. 
If you're someone out there though who thinks these, you watch these videos and you tried to practice it and you're still frustrated, it's still not working for you, just please be patient with yourself. Keep practicing. But if you think that you need to do this in person, go ahead and contact me. My phone number and my email will be in the description down below. We'll also put it on the screen right here. And now you guys can contact me. We can set up two days. Pamela did two days with me, one hour and a half maybe each day. And look at the progress she's already made. Set that up with me and we can go do it over a weekend if you work during the week or if you're, it's better for you to do it during the week because maybe you work remotely or from home. Great, we'll set it up and now you guys can be part of this amazing, life-saving skill that is swimming. It only went down. <laughs> That's great. That is awesome. Now, that is a gorgeous stroke. You're not, wow. dr you're not dropping your hand when you breathe. It looks fine. Okay. The only other explanation I can think of is sometimes people don't kick strong enough through the breath. Okay. And because the breath is a little less efficient than not breathing, you're creating resistance that's already slowing you down. If you stop that kicking, makes, that makes sense. If you stop yeah. kicking too, you're getting slowed way down and dropping into the water. So in order to maintain that high body position that we discussed at the beginning of yesterday, just kick a little bit stronger through the breaths for a while until your body gets used to that and you don't have to think about it anymore. Okay? Yeah, put your fins on. Let's go two more. Just doing it with the fins and then we'll get into some treading water. So now we're gonna learn treading water. When you tread water, there are two components, your arms and your legs. And I'll also teach you how a couple of tricks or tips, secrets that most people don't know that'll make the entire process come together for you. A lot of people get frustrated because they struggle, they start to sink, they can't figure it out, they just can't stay up. Well, let's start with the arms. The hands are like frosting a cake, moving back and forth on an angle redirecting water downward, okay? You're always moving in the direction of the back of your hand. So if you want to go upward, you're going to stay up, you're going to redirect water downward, okay? I also like to tell people it's kind of like directing a fire. Okay? So I'm moving my hands back and forth. Now, you it really well, you can create a whirlpool over your forearm, and if I can't create it here, it'll be proof I can't do it. <laughs> there it is. So this whirlpool now, over my hand, is what you're going for. If you can create that whirlpool, you'll be able to stay up because you're redirecting water downwards so powerfully and fast. Wow, this is the best whirlpool I've ever created. I don't want to let it go. <laughs> it's amazing. So frosting the cake, directing the choir, redirecting water downwards. Start there because some people can tread water with just their arms. They don't even need their legs. Okay? So let's start there. No legs. Correct. Your arms are more efficient than your legs. So 
just pushing water downwards. Good. Go ahead and return to the wall. Now, the second step is not the legs yet. It's to lean forward because our bodies float better horizontally than they do vertically. Okay? So if you lean forward with your hips behind you and your chest forward, you'll be able to do this a lot easier. A lot easier. Okay? I'm still not really using my legs. Once I start using my legs, I can go to a more vertical position, but even I, when I played water polo and I was treading water, I would often conserve my energy by getting my hips up to the surface and treading like this rather than straight up and down. So let's try it again. Just the arms forward, lean forward. Good. Excellent. You almost got a whirlpool over your left arm there too. Yeah. So, already Pamela's able to at least stay up for a few seconds. Once she gets, brings in the legs, she'll be able to stay up longer and she'll have to practice that though in order to ever feel comfortable. Treading water is not efficient. For instance, I don't recommend it if you're just trying to survive like you fell off a boat or into a pool and you can't swim. Don't tread water. Don't try to tread water. Don't even learn treading water in preparation for an emergency. If all you're doing is trying to make yourself able to survive in an emergency, then you need to learn the back float. Chin up, chest up, keep lungs full there. Treading water should be done for water pool players, people just going into deep pools with friends and they want to kind of talk with them or, or socialize, or triathletes who are waiting, or open water swimmers who are waiting for a race to start. Okay? So because it's not efficient to do, you really ought not be doing it unless you're some sort of swimming athlete. <laughs> There's no other purpose for it other than socializing or killing time before a race. Otherwise, float on your back. All right, so let's go to um, the leg portion now. With your kick, you want to redirect water downward with the inside of your heels. It's a one-footed breaststroke kick known as an egg beater kick. Okay, so what I do is I bring my knees up to my chest, then I get my ankles out to the side, and then I pull the water down. If you get really good at this, then once you bring your knees up to your chest and your ankles out to the side, and then get your knee down, hinging at your hip, get your knee down to create an even stronger weight. So this would be without the knee dip at the end. The knee dip is like your bonus tip. This would be with the knee whip, the knee dip. Okay, that's way more efficient. I'm hardly even trying now. I'm just making my feet go through the motions. Good. Bring your knees up to your chest. Get your ankles out to the side. Lean forward. Yes, you're treading water. <laughs> yourself around so easily. Because, yeah, exactly. Turning yourself around treading water is actually quite easy. Good. All right. So now Pamela is treading water. So remember the three tips. Arms frosting a cake. Lean forward. And bring your knees up, ankles out. Okay? Those are, those are the things you need to keep in mind when learning to tread water successfully. So I just want to say that I feel like I have improved a tremendous amount in a short amount of time. I have been working on my swimming after I learned virtually. Um, it, it's very, very hard to improve. You can get tips, but as far as getting corrections in real time, there's nothing like being here in person. I don't live close to a swim instructor, unfortunately, so I was so happy to have this time. I really feel like my swimming has improved. It was worth it. Um, so if you have the opportunity or the ability to come in person, if you're a person that's working virtually, I can definitely, I can be a testament to say that I think it will really improve your swimming if you have the ability to do so. 
Well, Rocketeers, I was really grateful to have Pamela here in Austin to take some lessons with me for two days. She showed tremendous progress. She's an incredible student. I'm very proud and, and honored to have met her. She enriched my life, and I hope I was able to enrich hers. That's all we have for you today. Thanks for watching this video. If you found it helpful, splash that like button, subscribe to the channel for free, and follow us over, over on our other social media channels like Instagram and TikTok for shorter videos and clips throughout the week. Check out our merch store, and we'll see you in the next video.